Hi, I'm Jim Ward of the Middle Country Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to our 100th episode in our History Bites series. We are so happy you have enjoyed our episodes and look forward to providing you with more interesting and engaging historical content. Today, we will discuss the bombardment of Fort Sumter, which were the first shots fired in the American Civil War on April 12, 1861. Fort Sumter was first built in the wake of, of the War of 1812, which had highlighted the United States' lack of strong coast, coastal defenses. Named for Revolutionary War General and South Carolina native Thomas Sumter, the fortification was one of nearly 50 forts built as part of the so-called Third System, a coastal defense program implemented by Congress in 1817. The three-tiered, five-sided fort's coastal placement was designed to allow it to control access to the vital Charleston Harbor. While the island itself was only 2.4 acres in size, the fort was built to accommodate a garrison of 650 soldiers and 135 artillery pieces. The fort was still under construction during the last months of President James Buchanan's term when a succession of events occurred that brought the contending regions of the United States to the verge of armed conflict. Soon after the election of Abraham Lincoln in November 1860, the state of South Carolina called a convention that passed an ordinance of secession on December 20th, 1860, and Governor Francis Pickens sent commissioners to Washington, D.C to claim possession of the forts in Charleston Harbor and all other U.S. property in his state. Despite Charleston's position as a major port, at the time only two companies of federal troops guarded the harbor. Commanded by Major Robert Anderson, these companies were stationed at Fort Moultrie, a dilapidated fortification facing the coastline. Recognizing that Fort Moultrie was vulnerable to a land assault, Anderson elected to abandon it for the more easily defensible Fort Sumter on December 26, 1860. South Carolina militia forces would seize the city's other forts shortly, shortly thereafter, leaving Fort Sumter as the lone federal outpost in Charleston. A peace conference called by Virginia also met in Washington and suggested amendments to the Constitution that would satisfy Southern grievances. Lincoln and the leaders of the Republican Party refused to accept the adjustments that the Southerners demanded. In the meantime, Buchanan sent an unarmed commercial steamer, Star of the West, with over 200 U.S. troops and supplies intended for Fort Sumter. However, it was turned back when it was fired upon in the harbor on January 9, 1861. Between January 9th and February 1st, six other states, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas followed South Carolina's example. Without attempting negotiation, their governors seized all the forts and arsenals in their respective states, except Fort Pickens in the harbor of Pensacola, Florida. Delegates from the seceding states met at Montgomery, Alabama, organized the Confederate States of America, and set up a provisional government with Jefferson Davis as president. Davis's inauguration took place on February 18th. The Confederate government then assumed control of the negotiations about Sumter. Neither Buchanan nor Davis was eager to precipitate a crisis. Buchanan's fervent desire apparently was to leave the solution of the whole problem to his successor. Davis sent General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, an engineer officer of distinction, to Charleston to complete the defenses of the harbor. The day after Beauregard reached Charleston, Lincoln was inaugurated in Washington, D.C. on March 4th. In Lincoln's inaugural speech, he spoke conciliatory words to the South, quote, We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Major Anderson refused repeated calls to abandon Fort Sumter, and by March 1861, 
there were over 3,000 militia troops besieging his garrison. A number of other U.S. military facilities in the South had already been seized, and Fort Sumter was viewed by many as one of the South's few remaining hurdles to overcome before achieving sovereignty. Knowing that Anderson and his men were running out of supplies, Lincoln announced his intention to send three unarmed ships to relieve Fort Sumter. Having already declared that any attempt to resupply the fort would be seen as an act of aggression, South Carolina militia forces soon scrambled to respond. On April 11th, militia commander PGT Beauregard demanded that Anderson surrender the fort. But Anderson again refused. In response, Beauregard opened fire on Fort Sumter shortly after 4.30 a.m. on April 12, 1861. The order to fire was given to ardent secessionist Edmund Ruffin, who fired a shot from a 64-pounder Columbiad at Fort Sumter. Beauregard's 19 coastal batteries unleashed a punishing barrage on Fort Sumter, eventually firing an estimated 3,000 shots at the Citadel in 34 hours. By, April, by Saturday, April 13th, cannon fire had broken through the fortress's five-foot-thick brick walls, causing fires inside the post. The next afternoon, Anderson agreed to surrender and evacuated the fort at noon on April 14th. When the, when the U.S. troops marched out of the fort, they waved the U.S. flag and carried out a gun salute. On the 50th round of the 100-gun salute, an explosion occurred, causing the only death of the engagement. Private Daniel Huff of the 1st U.S. Artillery Regiment was the first of as many as 850,000 Americans who would perish before the end of the American Civil War. The bombardment of Fort Sumter would be the beginning of what is, to this day, the bloodiest war in American history. In the, days that, in the days following the assault, Lincoln issued a call for Union volunteers to quash the rebellion, while more southern states, including Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, cast their lot with the Confederacy. After four years of war, Union soldiers were poised to retake the fort from the Confederates. Only when Union General William T. Sherman was poised to capture Charleston did the Confederates finally evacuate. Union forces would reclaim Fort Sumter on February 22, 1865. Robert A. Anderson and Abner Doubleday, the two commanding officers from the original siege of Fort Sumter, would both return to the fortress on April 14, 1865, for a flag-raising ceremony. On that day, Union officers and dignitaries gathered at Fort Sumter. A band played, several nearby Navy warships fired salutes, and there were hymns and prayers. Then, exactly four years to the day after he lowered the flag in surrender, General Robert Anderson raised it in triumph over the fort's battered and shot-torn walls. The flag was transformed into a symbol of a, of a restored and victorious United States. A witness observed, At first, I could not hear Colonel Anderson, for his voice came thickly, but soon he said clearly, I thank God I have lived to see this day. After a few more words, he began to hoist the flag. It went up slowly and hung limp, a weather-beaten, frayed, and shell-torn flag, not fit for much more work. But when it had crept clear of the shelter of the walls, a sudden breath of wind caught it, and it shook its folds and flew straight out above us. I think we stood up. Somebody started the star-spangled banner. We sang the first verse, which is all that most people know. It did not make much difference, for a great gun was fired close to us from the fort followed in obedience to the president's order by a national salute from every fort and battery that fired upon Fort Sumter. Thank you for joining us for today's episode. If you enjoyed it, click like, and if you watched on YouTube, hit subscribe. Thanks so much, and we'll see you all next time.